Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm going to begin this week a series. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's a difficult series. It's a difficult subject. When God doesn't do what he promised, finding victory in unanswered prayer. Wouldn't it be just a whole lot better if I preached about victorious Christian praying and, and we could all be just lifted up and enthused about um, increasing our prayer life and the exciting answers and wonderful things that God does. But the fact of the matter is that there are times that we have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and it seems that God does not answer. Now, I know the spiritual answer. And somebody's going to come up to me after the service and say, you know, even when God doesn't answer, he's still answering. You know, he might be saying waiting, or he might be saying no. And I'm going to tell you, guys and ladies, that if you come up with that answer the next time you say something to your spouse, and they don't answer you, and you walk away saying, it's okay, they really did answer. No, no, we don't do that with other people. But we, we tend to spiritualize it with God. And I'm just going to be honest with you. This is an issue that for most of my life I have struggled from time to time with. God, where are you? God, are you hearing me? God, are you answering me? And I'm just going to be honest as I present these messages over the next six sessions, okay? We're going to look at this subject in, in six sessions over the next seven weeks. Um, finding victory in unanswered prayer. I uh, heard a, a broadcast on the radio where a Christian wrote in, um, a Christian with a problem wrote into the broadcast, and I was able to get a hold of the letter. And I want you to hear what this man writes. He says, this is a, man for, a letter from a man by the name of Kevin. And he writes, I am a prisoner trying to draw close to God using all the resources I can to help me with my relationship with God. We have material from several preachers available to us here in the prison. A lot of the material has helped me grow in my walk with God, but I'm uneasy about some of what I read, particularly from those who teach about health and wealth. I received a monthly letter a few months ago that said that there was power in my confession. And if I were to take authority over my situation and shout, I am rich, these blessings would come to me. Well, I did this for several months, but I've not received any extra money. In fact, now the money from my commissary account doesn't make it on time. More recently, I been, began confessing that I walk in divine health like their ministry instructs me to, but I discovered that my liver enzymes were off and other lab results were not encouraging. Since then, I've changed my prayer and confess that I am only healed if God wants me to be, so I struggle with whether these ministries are of God or whether they are demonic. Now, these are his words. Then I thought that if God were to strike that ministry in judgment, then I would know it was wrong. Please give me your advice on this. I'm afraid of making false accusations about ministries that talk about Jesus and say they're anointed of God. I just don't know that their teaching doesn't work for me. Well, Kevin, it doesn't work. That kind of teaching doesn't work for you. And it doesn't work for millions and millions of others. It just doesn't work. But it's something that we are surrounded with, and it's something that we hear on the airwaves, and it's something that we talk even, um, it, it creeps into our own conversations. I don't know how many times I've had people come to me and, and, um, and talk about situations, say things like, you know what, if you just give it to God, then it's going to be okay. God will work it out. Well, what does work it out mean, folks? Does that mean that it's going to work out the way I want it to work out if I give it to God and really have faith? I, um, what about people that are sick and they've given it to God and they've prayed and they've given it to God and they're godly and they're righteous and they're holy and they walk with God and they walk closely with God and they are not healed? What about them? What about the people that struggle with marriages and people say, you know what, just trust the Lord and he'll work it out for you. What does work it out for you mean? Does that mean the way I want it to be worked out? And then do I evaluate a person's closeness to God based on what the solution is, what the, what the end outcome of all of this is? I've had people say to me, you know, if God's anointing is really on a church, the church will never, never struggle for money. 
So, so we evaluate whether God's anointing is on us based on how much money comes into the offering plate on Sunday. Well, then how do I relate that to me? Does that mean if I really am close to God and I trust God and I have faith and I walk with God that I and my family will never, ever lack for income? Surely that is not so because I know the opposite in my own life. I, I know the struggles. I know what it is to not be healed and I know what it is to not have the money to pay a bill. Where's God? Where's God in my unanswered prayer? And there are false teachings that creep their way in and, and we, we, we ask whatever you want. And if God, if it is good, if you're asking for a good thing, then God must do it for you. And if you've ever studied um, ancient Gnosticism, that's a form of ancient Gnosticism, folks, where they have separated good from evil and said everything that is good is from God and everything that is evil is not from God. And saying that whatever we ask, if it's a good thing, God will do it is a form of Gnosticism. We can simply speak ourselves rich. Well, if we could speak ourselves rich, we would all be rich, I think, okay? Um, um, certainly, all, most of us have prayed for additional income and help with our finances over the years. We can proclaim ourselves healed, and God is obligated to do that for us. I believe that God is a healing God. We anoint with oil um, the sick people in our church, and we believe in doing that in accordance with the instructions that James gave to us. But that does not mean... That does not mean that everyone that we anoint with oil and every sick person that we pray for is going to be healed. We have people uh, from our church that are sick right now. We have people from our church that are in the hospital right now. We have people that need um, help from God and encouragement from God and an uplift from God right now. And it's not because they lack faith. It's not because they lack holiness or righteousness in their life. And there are three false principles that I have identified as I listen to false doctrines of this sort. Principle number one is that there's no distinction between Old Testament promises given to Israel and New Testament promises given to believers. Sometimes it's easy to go to the Old Testament and pop a verse out of the Old Testament. And I'm an Old Testament guy. Okay, right, Tommy? I'm an Old Testament guy, <laughs> and I believe in the Old Testament, but let's be careful about understanding the distinction between promises given to Israel and the land and promises given to believers in the New Testament. The Old Testament tells, says that if you follow me, if you follow God, then um, God is going to bless you with riches and good crops. Now, that's a promise that's given to Old Testament Israel. And it's, we have to be careful about grabbing a hold of a promise like that and saying, well, that belongs to me today. God was speaking to Israel, which leads me, um, well, another one is um, the Lord said, I, if you obey me, if you follow me, I will keep all of these diseases from coming upon you. And so there are those that go into the Old Testament and say, see, there it is right there. If you obey the Lord, if you walk with the Lord, if you trust the Lord, if you follow the Lord, the Lord will keep you disease-free. Well, that leads me to the second principle, and it is that promises are false principle. Understand, these are false principles. Promises are not dependent on the context in which they were written. Well, what was the context that the Lord will keep you free from all the diseases of the Egyptians, okay? Take a look at the context, and God is letting them know. Obey me in the land. Obey me in the land. And the diseases that befell the Egyptians will not fall on you. Um, promises are dependent. They are dependent upon the context in which they are given. Otherwise, I would look at a guy like Naaman. And Naaman was a man that had leprosy in the Old Testament, and he came. Because a young servant girl who had been taken captive from Israel told her, in my land, there is a prophet of God. And he can tell you what to do. And Naaman came to him. And the prophet of God said, go dip in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be well. Now, if that isn't dependent on his context, then every time you and I get sick, all we need is a plane ticket, right, to Israel. And we can go dip in the Jordan River seven times. Make sure you count them out right. Seven times and you will be made well. No, there's a context and God was doing something very special for a man in the Old Testament revealing himself. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask what you will and it will be done for you. See, Jesus gave a context and said, abide in me. 
abide in me and I abide in you. And then we'll talk. Then we'll communicate. Then we'll fellowship. Then we'll have a relationship. And the desires of your heart will be done for you. And you know what I've discovered, folks? I've discovered that the closer I am with the Lord, the more my prayers change. Yeah, the more my prayers change. And a third false principle is the authority of the believer is an unlimited authority. That through Jesus Christ, we've received an unlimited authority. And this teaching almost goes to the point of saying that we are omnipotent in our authority in Jesus. I don't know about you, but I have never looked at a storm and said, peace be still. Well, now, maybe I've said it, okay? But it hasn't happened, and I don't have the authority to do that. Um, I, I read about a group some time ago that decided that they were going to go to New York City and they were going to banish Satan from New York City forever. Now, let me ask you how that worked out. And, and, and let me ask you this. If I could do that, then why would I banish him from the whole world? Why would I stop with New York City? The authority of the believer is a limited authority. I have no authority. And Jesus even said to Pilate, you would have no authority at all except God had given it to you. Jesus' authority is an unlimited authority, but mine is not. You see, normally we think that um, there's no victory in unanswered prayer. There's only victory when God answers in the way I want him to answer so that I can go to all my friends and say, wow, I have a wonderful, wonderful, glorious testimony. I prayed for this and God granted it. And sometimes that is the case. And I've rejoiced with some of you in recent weeks that have had wonderful, wonderful answers to prayer. But we don't always have those kinds of answers. And we don't all have those kinds of answers as often as we would sure like them to be. Victory, folks, is not in answered prayers. Are you ready for this? Victory is in Jesus. Victory is in a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's where your victory is. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to pause here a moment, and I'm going to let you know that I'm going to take six weeks to do this, to talk about this. And, and like I began with, it's a difficult subject, but I'm going to take six weeks to talk about it. And so, I'm not going to give you all that you probably want to hear today, so can you bear with me and be patient? I wonder as I look around, or down in our attendance a little bit, and did people see the victory and unanswered prayer, Carol, <laughs> and say, oh, I don't want to go hear that. And yet it applies to all of us because we all struggle and we all wonder, who's this series of messages for? Well, I put one of them in, I don't know, the bulletin, the newsletter or something. It's for those who are angry at God because you know that God could intervene and he hasn't. And maybe there's something specific in your life and you've wondered. I've been struggling with this and I prayed and I have asked God to take it away. And he didn't take it away. Folks, I remember the day that I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed all day long because I got news that my wife was missing and she didn't come back. She died in an accident that day. And there are people that look at things like that in life, the loss of a parent, the loss of a spouse, the loss of a child, the loss of who knows what, and have struggled and become angry with God because God could have intervened. Yes, he could have. Why didn't he? This series of messages is for those that believe that prayer changes nothing. You've prayed. You've asked your friends to pray. You filled out a blue card. You turned it into the prayer team and the staff and the elders, and we've prayed. But nothing has changed. And there are those believers in churches today that believe that prayer changes nothing. And this series of messages is for those who are discouraged with God because God seems to oversell and underdeliver. Years ago, I was in sales for a while. And what we were instructed to do was always undersell and overdeliver. But sometimes when we read the Bible, we may feel like God is overselling. And we read a verse like in all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And you say, wow, that's a good sales point. But then it happens. And you ask whatever you will, and you don't receive. And you wonder, where's God? See, in our text today, Hebrews 10, 
talks about real people who believed on Jesus and were going through a time of great testing in their life. Don't misunderstand. They were spiritual. They were righteous. They were holy. They had a relationship with Jesus Christ as their Savior. They were committed to the Lord. And I'm going to show you in a moment how committed they were. But they were committed to death to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was no deliverance for them. They prayed and there was no deliverance. I want you to see, number one, the suffering that they faced. Number two, the challenge that they encountered. Number three, the attitude that they had in the midst of it all. Number four, the reward that awaited them. And then some final observations about the text. I hope I can get through all of that today. Would you stand together with me and let's read our scripture? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 to 39. And it says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Heavenly Father, as we approach this subject that is real to all of us, May we find victory in every part of our walk with you. May we understand that our victory is based on relationship with Jesus, not life working out the way we had planned it or do plan it and want it to be. May our faith never waver. May we never shrink back. May we stand with you to the very end until the day we receive our eternal reward. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. God has an agenda that you might know spiritual victory in your life. And sometimes the way God brings it about is through unanswered prayer. God's agenda is that you might know spiritual victory in your life. And God is going to do that how God has determined to do it in your life. And so the first thing I want you to see concerning the believers in Hebrews chapter 10 is the suffering that they faced. Understand this. They faced severe suffering for one reason and one reason only, because of Jesus. Not because of sin. Not because of unrighteousness. They faced suffering difficult suffering, harsh suffering, because of their faith, not because of their lack of faith. The scripture says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light. The apostle to the Hebrews is saying, remember the days after you got saved. They're saved. They're Christian men and women. The apostle goes on and says, you stood your ground in a great contest. The Greek word for contest is, is athletes, from which we get our modern English word athletics. In a way, it carries the idea of people making sport of you because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Jews were turning on Christians, Jewish converts, whether they be Jewish converts or Gentile converts. Jews were turning especially on the Jewish converts who turned to Jesus Christ, making sport of them and making life difficult for them, mocking them, betraying them, persecuting them, even killing them. But the apostle to the Hebrews says you stood your ground during this great context. The apostle goes on and says... 
You were publicly exposed to insult and persecution because of Jesus, because of their faithfulness, folks, not because of their unfaithfulness. They were subjected to humiliation and to cruelty because of Jesus. Is that going on today in the world? Yes, it is. Okay, in China, believers have been paraded through the streets and and Christian pastors paraded through the streets having been abused and beaten and, and I don't know what to call it, but decorated, hung with torn Bibles and Christian artifacts and symbols and images, crosses and the like, humiliated as they're marched through the streets and the people taunt them and throw things at them and ridicule them. In India, I don't know if you heard in the news, Pastor Gideon, I always have a hard time with his last name, was, was preaching truth to his congregation. And the Islamic extremists brought much persecution and accusation to him. They harassed him on every front and on every side. And finally, Pastor Gideon was found hanging to death in his home. The authorities, the Indian authorities, who also were Islamic, came in to investigate this and determined that he had committed suicide. No, he didn't. He was hung to death, and the evidence was there, but they refused to admit it. He was hung to death by those that hated him. In Kenya, not too long ago, a church was set on fire as a bomb went off. And there were about 80 believers that were inside of this church building and they came running out to save themselves from this horrendous fire. And outside were militants with machine guns that mowed them down, men and women and children. Now let me tell you something, the pastors and believers in China that are humiliated, Pastor Gideon in India, the believers in Kenya, they didn't lack faith, folks. They were men and women and children of faith. They didn't lack prayer lives. They were people of prayer. They were people committed. They were people who loved Jesus. They were people that gave it all to Jesus. And from man's perspective, no, it didn't work out. Their prayers sure seemed to be unanswered, and they faced suffering. At other times... Verse 33 in our text tells us that these Hebrew Christians, that their suffering was voluntary. The apostle to the Hebrews says you stood side by side with those who were so treated. People were arrested. People were accused. People were brought in for trial. They stood side by side. How? How so? Well, they sympathized with those in prison. Do you understand that when these people were arrested and tried and put into prison, that if you came to minister to them, if you came to visit them, if you came to bring them food, if you came to bring them nourishment, if you came to bring them medical supplies, what were you doing? You were identifying as one of them. You were exposing yourself. And the apostle to the Hebrews commends them and says, you are great people of faith. You stood side by side with those who were mistreated. You sympathized with those who were in prison. And as a result, you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your own property in the ancient times when this was written and these things were being done. There were people that were known as the 10 percenters. If you turned in someone that you knew was a Christian, when the authorities came in and took everything away from them, you got 10% of everything that they had, of all their wealth and all their belongings. And so it was profitable for you to find Christians and turn them in. The apostle says to them, you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Confiscation in the Greek, by the way, means plundering by mobs. Their homes were overrun. Their possessions were overrun. They could not defend themselves. They could only say, may God be glorified. How about today? Suffering today is not the result of lack of faith. In North Korea, Christians are imprisoned in labor camps, subject to 
hard labor and cruel treatment because of their faith, not because of their lack of faith. In Afghanistan and Somalia, both of those countries, the Islamic people boast there is not one single Christian in all of Afghanistan, in all of Somalia. And if you profess to be a Christian, you will die. Not because of your lack of faith, because of your faith. In Sudan... Churches are under commissioned to be destroyed, to be demolished, all of them. Christians are losing their places of worship and soon will lose their lives, many have already, not because of their lack of faith, folks, because of their faith. Second thing I want you to see is the challenge that these people encountered says they suffered joyfully and conf confidently because there was something better that God had in mind. A better and lasting possession. Guess what? As good as life might be for you today, God has something better for you. As bad as life might be for you, the good news is God has something better for you. Now, I could tell you that if you just name it and claim it, you're going to get it right now. But I can't tell you that, folks, because it's not always the case. Truth is truth always, okay? It doesn't change. But these people had a better and lasting possession. Verse 35 says, so do not throw away your confidence, which will be greatly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Stand with Jesus. Stand with Jesus. Stand with Jesus. Don't let your faith waver. Don't shrink back. Don't be afraid of what this world has to offer or to throw at you or to accuse you with. God has a reward for those who are his children. God has a reward for those who stand secure, for those who stand strong in the Lord. And these people in Hebrews needed endurance. They were running well and, accept, and accepting their suffering well. But, but, they continued to cry out to God and justice never came. And sometimes, folks, when we cry out to God and cry out to God, and cry out to God, we grow weary. Let's be honest. Sometimes we grow weary. How many of you have been asking God for the salvation of children for decades upon decades upon decades? I had a person tell me this last week. He's been in a difficult marriage for, I don't know, at least 20 years, maybe more. And he struggled with that. And remain true to the Lord. And he said, I'm going to tell you right now, Pastor Russell, I don't know that I will continue to be married. I don't know that we're going to survive this. But I've prayed. And I've asked God. How many of you have struggled with illness, sickness, disease? We have people from our church in the hospital right now. Stephen had um, surgery on his ankle. Um, some of you remember Pat Jenkins is in the hospital right now with a very mysterious disease. They don't know what, uh, sickness, they don't know what the cause of it is. And there are others. And sometimes, let's be honest, we grow weary. Sometimes I grow weary. And sometimes I'm tempted to lose my confidence in the Lord. That's the challenge that they faced, being human. Being human, folks. We can come to church and we can put on the smile and thrust out our chest and stand tall and strong. But inside of ourselves, we hurt and we're weak and we're bent over and we're crippled in our soul because so long we've prayed and we've asked and the answer has not come. There's an ever-present danger of losing our confidence in the Lord. And Christians, yes, Christians get discouraged. 
They get discouraged for a variety of reasons, okay? Injustice and unfair, cruel treatment. Around the world, Christians are being treated unfairly. But Hebrews says, don't throw in the towel. Those, those are my words. Don't throw in the towel. Because standing strong comes with a great reward. Stand strong, stand strong. Sometimes there are those who lose their confidence because of bad dealings with other Christians. It's not the world, it's not the pagans, it's not the unbelievers, it's not the sinners. It's the people I sit in church with, the people I fellowship with, the people I go to Bible study with that just annoy me, <laughs> irritate me. Or maybe they're unfair to me. Maybe they've just wronged me. And there are those that conclude if that's the way Christians are, I don't want anything to do with them or God. Not that kind of God. And others, others are challenged because prayers are unanswered. And they question, where is God? Where are the promises? What about the promises God gave? That if I trust him, if I believe, if I cry out to him, he will do it. You see, the Christian life is a challenge. But it also comes with great reward. I want you to see, want you to see the attitude they had. They stayed focused on the reward. Verse 34, you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. You knew. They focused on the reward. Verse 35, your confidence will receive rich reward. Verse 36, you will receive what God has promised. Verse 37, he's coming. He's coming again. We sang about the coming of Jesus. It's real, folks. Jesus is coming again. Focus on the reward. That's the attitude that we need to have. There's a reward. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming for you and for me. The Bible says that one day, one day, Jesus will come on the clouds. A trumpet will sound. And they that are dead will be raised up to be with him. And then they that are alive at his coming will be caught up to meet him in the air. It will be a time of rejoicing. It will be a time of reward. And then Jesus is going to bring us right back to this earth after the tribulation time is over and we will reign with him for a thousand years. Yeah, there's a reward. There's a good time. Maybe I've struggled for 10 years with an issue. Maybe I've struggled for 20, maybe 30, maybe 50, maybe 60. That doesn't much compare to the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus and eternity that follows that. The Bible says my... Suffering is present and momentary. Eternity is forever. Verse 38, but my righteous one, by the way, that's you and me. Sometimes the Bible, when it refers to the righteous one, is referring to Jesus. Here, but my righteous one, you and me, shall live by faith. And if he or she shrinks back, I won't be pleased. God says, you're my righteous one. Keep that attitude in mind. Focus on the reward. And the reward that awaited them is the fourth thing I want you to see. So what is the great reward that we are to focus on? Well, the future fulfillment of all of the promises of Scripture. There is a future fulfillment when every single promise of the book will be a reality. The day is coming. The day is real. The issue is true. The scriptures, the promises will be fulfilled. The promises of health and wealth, folks, are not wrong. They're delayed. Do you understand that? We're going to be well for all eternity. There is health that comes to those who are in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says there's no more sickness, no more sorrow. No more tears, no more dying. That's all going to pass away. It's going to be gone. Do I have a promise of health in Christ Jesus? You bet I do. But it's not today because I live in a broken, fallen world. The Bible is filled. Everybody in the Bible died. Some of them very cruel deaths. Peter, Paul, put to death at a cruel hand. 
Ah, but they didn't die. Just their body passed away, and they live for all eternity. It's their reward that awaited them in Christ Jesus. Jesus is coming again, and justice will prevail, and every promise will be fulfilled, and when we receive new bodies, every blessing of God will come to us. Is health real? You better believe health is real. Eternal health, eternal healing. Is wealth real? I don't see anything in the Bible that tells me that I'm going to be short on cash in heaven. And if I was, I guess I could go out and chip up a piece of the street. <laughs> yeah, health and wealth. It's a promise of God, but it's delayed today. I live in this present broken fallen world. But I have a reward that I'm looking forward to. Don't throw your confidence away. There is great reward in standing strong. So what are the promises that God gave? Yeah, they're real. They're true. But let's not misapply them. Let's look forward to the day when we are caught into his presence and all of his blessings are poured out upon us. Now, let me give you some observations. And again, don't be discouraged. I have five more weeks after this to talk about this subject. Observations. Number one, suffering doesn't mean that you're out of the will of God. Don't ever believe that. Don't ever think that. I wasn't going to mention this, but I'm going to throw it in free, free of charge this morning. At Thursday morning men's Bible study, we were wrapping up the book of Romans. At the end of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul is getting ready to go to Jerusalem, and then he's going to go to Rome, and then he's going to go to Spain. But he knows that in Rome, there are people that detest him and hate him. And so he asked the, the people in the Roman church, pray for his safety. Paul, I would say, is a righteous man, wouldn't you? Paul has a very close relationship with the Lord. That I believe. Paul is a man of great faith. And Paul said, pray for my safety. And he went to Jerusalem and he was not safe. And they arrested him. And they tried him on two occasions, kept him in prison, and sent him off to Rome to be tried before Caesar, where eventually he was put to death. Suffering isn't because you're out of the will of God. Sometimes we suffer in the will of God. And it's God's design for us. You see, the author of Hebrews says to these people that are suffering, you have need of endurance, not repentance. He isn't saying, well, if you guys would get right with Jesus, you wouldn't be going through this stuff. He says, you're in the middle of it. You're staying in the middle of it. You have need of endurance from the Holy Spirit at work in your life that you might stand strong to the very end. Suffering doesn't mean that you're out of the will of God. Unanswered prayer is not a sign that you are out of the will of God. Remember Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. It didn't pass. It didn't pass. And Jesus went from that point in the Garden of Gethsemane to being tortured, abused, beaten, scourged beyond my mind's ability to understand and comprehend, ridiculed, a crown of thorns pressed down upon his head, a reed put in his hands, purple draped around him in mockery, and nailed with real iron spikes to a wooden cross to die and was forsaken by God. And never, no, never, not one second was he outside of the will of God. For God willed this. Suffering does not mean that we are out to the will of God. Observation number two, suffering doesn't last forever. And we need to keep that in mind. Suffering doesn't last forever. And unanswered prayers will be answered 
concerning our health, concerning our wellness, concerning our security, concerning our protection. In eternity, they will be answered. Unanswered prayer doesn't last forever, but God does. Hardship doesn't last forever, but eternity does. Persecution doesn't last forever, but your reward does. Keep focused. Keep your, eye, keep your eyes on the prize. Observation number three. Suffering and unanswered prayer does not mean that you don't have enough faith. Verse 38, live by faith and do not shrink back. Living by faith doesn't mean everything's going to be okay. Living by faith doesn't mean that God's going to work it out according to your will, according to your plan, according to your desire, according to your convenience, or according to your comfort. Living by faith means that you're trusting him. You're walking with him. You're depending on him for what you need right now. In the middle of all this. To continue in fellowship and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four. All of the promises of God are true and absolute. Every one of them, folks. I don't care if it's Old Testament or New Testament. Every promise of God is true and absolute. However... Until I see Jesus face to face, I live with unfulfilled promises. The book of Isaiah says to me and to you, by his, Jesus stripes, we are healed. Now I know some of you can identify with this. Every Sunday when I stand on this platform and preach to you, I stand here in pain. My wife can attest to that. But there's going to be a day that I'm going to be healed. And I'm going to stand for all eternity in the presence of my Lord, not in pain. But until I see Jesus face to face, I live with unfulfilled promises. Next week, I want you to see Abraham, who died without seeing the promises fulfilled. The week after that, we're going to look in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, the whole book. Next week, Abraham, who died without seeing the promises fulfilled. Will he see them fulfilled? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. If you're in my eschatology class, you know that Abraham is going to be resurrected in the millennial period that he is going to see his descendants a great nation of people it is going to be literally fulfilled the promise of the land is going to be literally fulfilled and Abraham is going to see it the promise that through his seed all the earth will be blessed is going to be fulfilled and Abraham will see it but does he see it today did he see it in his lifetime no but he will. Today we have the drop. Tomorrow the ocean, folks. Today we have the flower. Tomorrow the whole eternal garden. Today we have the hors d'oeuvres. Tomorrow the marriage supper. Unfulfilled promises today but they will not be unfulfilled forever. Is it worth it to keep on believing and following whether your answers are, your prayers are answered or not? It's worth it. It's worth it. The righteous will live by faith. Faith is the ability to receive whatever God gives me. I want you to understand that. Because out of all the things that I said today, that might be number one. Faith is the ability to receive victoriously what God has given to me. Faith isn't if I just believe hard enough, big enough, good enough, I'll get what I want. Faith is the ability to receive what God 
has given to me. When I look at verse 39, the very last verse in our text, but we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who believe and are saved. That's not talking about losing your salvation. You know you can't lose your salvation. We're not those who shrink back and are destroyed. What's being destroyed? Our victory. Our victory. If you shrink back, you lose your victory. And this, this series is all about finding victory in unanswered prayer. Don't shrink back. Keep your eyes on the prize. I'm going to conclude with this. In two weeks, we'll be in the book of Habakkuk. But the same Habakkuk that earlier in the book said the just shall live by faith. And Habakkuk lives in a very difficult time. We'll see that in two weeks. Habakkuk concludes this, and it's one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, Though your car breaks down and your washing machine quits working. Just when you lost your job. And your wife got sick. And your children rebel. Yet. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. How do we find victory in unanswered prayer? Never forget God's faithfulness. Never forget God's reward. Never forget that God is with us to give us endurance and strength and encouragement in a broken and fallen world. Never forget that there is a better day coming, an eternal day that will not pass away. When what we hope for today becomes reality, when we lo what we long for today becomes ours forever and ever. May we rejoice in God, our Savior. Pray together with me. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the fact that you do answer prayer. And every one of us, Lord, can look at our lives and our prayer lives and see times that you did step in, you did intervene. And I thank you for that. But I also thank you, Lord, that as the people of Hebrews 10 cried up to you, and they were not delivered. That you gave them endurance and you gave them strength and you gave them encouragement and you gave them the ability to stand strong, which was a great answer to their prayer so that they honored you in their lives and entered into, partly at least, their great possession in Christ Jesus that will be fully realized at the return of our Lord. Give us endurance, God. For those who have given up on you because things haven't worked out as they had hoped, give endurance. Help us to stand strong and not shrink back and to remember that our great reward is yet to come and it's eternal. No matter what life on this earth may bring, may we be a people who rejoice in God our Savior. Amen.